Good afternoon. Um, I'm Evelyn Hammonds. I'm professor of the history of science and African and African American studies. And welcome to our webinar, which examines the historical and um, contemporary impact of epidemic diseases on African American communities in the United States. And today I'm very happy to have with me uh, Professor Kathy Cohen, who I'll introduce in a few minutes. And today, we're, the title we gave to this conversation is Prelude to COVID-19, Lessons from the Epidemic of HIV AIDS for the Current Pandemic in African American Communities. And we will talk about that, but we'll also talk about some other issues as well. So just for the opening notes, logistics, uh, please note on the slide, all participants will have muted video and microphone, microphone during the conversation. There'll be a 15 minute Q&A after the conversation. So please post your questions using the Q&A button on the screen. Slides and recording of the conversation will be available in about a week and on, uh, on our website. Uh, and also you can send questions after the conversation to um, race and gender and science and medicine uh, at the Hutchins Center. And we'll soon be loading up some additional readings based on the conversation. So just to remind you about the Q&A, um, during the conversation, the chat function is for comments between participants only. And during the Q&A, which will be the last uh, 15 minutes of our conversation, uh, the Q&A function is for short questions uh, for uh, myself or Professor Cohen. And I'll be curating the questions and um, <coughs> uh, where they take us. So, Thank you all for, for joining us this afternoon. Um, I'm so, so happy to have my dear friend, uh, Kathy J. Cohen. Kathy is the David and Mary Winton Green Professor in the College and the Department of Political Science at the University of Chicago. She formerly served as Chair of the Department of Political Science, Director of the Center for the Study of Race, Politics, and Culture, and Deputy Provost for Graduate Education at the University of Chicago. Cohen's first academic position was at Yale University, where she was the first African-American woman to receive tenure in the social sciences, which I didn't know until I read this. Sad. Um, <laughs> Cohen is the author of two books, The Boundaries of Blackness, AIDS and the Breakdown of Black Politics, and Democracy Remixed, Black Youth in the Future of American Politics. She's also co-editor of the anthology, Women Transforming Politics, an Alternative Reader, she is co-editor of a book series with Fred Harris at Oxford University Press entitled Transgressing Boundaries, Studies in Black Politics and Black Communities. She founded and directs two public facing research projects, one of which we'll talk about today, the Gen Forward Survey Project and the Black Youth Project. Kathy is the recipient of numerous awards, including her recent election to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She currently sits on the boards of the Russell Sage Foundation and the Field Foundation. So Kathy, of course, lives in Chicago. And as you can see from the slide, Chicago is one of the places where the coronavirus has definitely had a severe impact on communities of color. And as you can see, uh, this really, I think, evocative image on the slide. Uh, and I just took one co quote out of that. Though Latino residents make up less than a third of Chicago's population of 2.7 million, they account for 40% of all positive cases, and Black residents make up about 30% of the city and account for 50% of the city's death toll in the pandemic. And this was reported in the New York Times. So I wanted to begin, Kathy, uh, just by saying so many commentators have made um, claims about why Black people have been disproportionately impacted and affected um, by this pandemic. So what reasons do you give when people ask you that question? Well, I, I usually say white supremacy in the history of racism in this country uh, as a shorthand, but I, you know, uh, what do I mean by that? Um, I think there is, of course, one analysis that says um, black people suffer with comorbidities and right. thus the disease is one or the virus is one that exacerbates kind of people suffering who have comorbidities. What do I mean by that? If you have diabetes, if you have hypertension, uh, the work your lungs must do um, is exaggerated. And so the virus can kind of prey on 
those comorbidities. And in fact, we just saw the, I think it's the Secretary of Health and Human Services was on CNN. And one of the interviewers said, you know, how do we make sense of the fact that the United States has like 5% of the population in the world and 30% of the deaths from, yeah. from COVID-19. And he said, well, basically he said, those people, you know, people are sick. We suffer with more comorbidities. And the, yes. the interviewer said, well, you can't really be blaming people, right? That's the, and, and he kind of doubled down on that. And, and we hear that over and over again. The way to understand what's happening in black communities and black and Latinx communities is about kind of the sickness of the people. Yes. But of course, you know, we would, that's an incomplete answer. We know that uh, the reason in which we suffer from comorbidities is because of the history of segregation, right? The food deserts that exist in our communities. Um, the fact that there's often less green space, right? There's fewer opportunities for exercise. I mean, we can go the higher levels of poverty, which all contribute to right to kind of the creation of an environment of sickness in which people of color often uh, exist. And so we could go on and on about yeah, huh? What did you say? Of housing, of course. Yes, it, we could we could we could go through the list. I'd be happy to go through the list. The fact that we're more likely to be uninsured, have less less access to quality health care, and so when I when people say why do we think this is happening to communities of color, I say again the history of racism, uh, of white supremacy, of disinvestment in Black and Latinx communities um, that provide kind of the environment in which people are working hard, suffering more, more vulnerable in terms of both their health and their economic and social lives. Uh, and it, it leads to right, um, uh, community spread and increased vulnerability to disease. Right, I, I mean, I think for, for those of us who've been looking at these, the, this long history of the effects of um, segregation, Jim Crow, white supremacy, this has not been a surprise. It's just been a sad inevitability uh, that makes it very difficult to, to really be quiet when this is, as you hear people like the secretary say, say things that, that they said today. So I want to turn just hey, Evelyn. Can I just this just to the people who are watching? We're going to do this all back and forth. I'm going to interrupt you, right? <laughs> so which is, which is, but this is the kind of how ridiculous it is when, uh, it, the government, the president, some black mayors are shocked, right, by the disproportionate impact in black communities. It's like if you don't understand the history, both I would I would say of black communities, but really of this country. Right. Um, then you can be shocked. But if you have any understanding of the ways in which inequality has been reproduced throughout the history of this country, um, then you can't be shocked that there would be a disproportionate impact on communities of color. And our response can't be limited to this pandemic, right? It has to be, what do we want beyond the pandemic? How do we deal with both the, the disproportionate impact here but the disparities that led to this disproportionate impact. Yeah. I, I know. I, I, I feel that, you know, th those people have been, you know, shocked, shocked, shocked. And it's sort of been a way in which the media captures this sort of production of outrage. Uh, and, and it's very hard. My outrage does not come from the same place that theirs come from. <laughs> My outrage comes from the fact that, you know, this is not news. This was going to happen. As I said, an inevitability about it that I wished was not, that I felt... I really wish would not happen, but it was it was just predetermined. It was going to happen this way, mm -hmm. and so I I think that that's um, so for people who are shocked, I I just find it almost incomprehensible. But let me turn to one question because I really want us to talk about um, the 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 data you brought about the the young folks, which I think is something people haven't really been paying much attention to. So, but when you published your book, The Boundaries of Blackness, um, AIDS and the Breakdown of Black Politics in 1999, AIDS was the number one killer of young black men and women in New York City. And so back to our, the previous point, I was looking at data today and in the zip code in Atlanta, 30331, uh, it has the highest rates of coronavirus uh, cases, but also still has the highest rates of HIV infection in the state of Georgia. 
they are right there sitting together. Um, and what you did in your book, you went on to chronicle how black political leaders initially failed to accept the challenge that AIDS presented. Of course, some people came around. But looking back and looking forward to today, um, how do you see the role of black political leadership, um, their responses to COVID in particular? You are in a city where there's a black mayor uh, who I think, as I recall, expressed a certain amount of outrage and disbelief. Um, and so how did that, how did that strike you, um, when you when you heard those comments? Right, I, I, I happen to be in the wonderful city of Chicago. Um, where there is a black lesbian mayor, let's yep. you know, uh, let's locate her, her positionality, um, and I, I was also shocked when she was, I think, surprised by the disproportionate impact. Let me just say, I think the mayor has done a great job in leading the city through this moment, for the most part. I mean, I think there's yeah, there's an outrage now about when the uh, lakeshore will be open, but um, you know, I. I think black politicians are always politicians, right? Uh, and one of the things that we know about the, the work of politicians from political science is part of their calculation has to be thinking about reelection, right? Uh, and constituencies. Um, and so I, this, you know, some people have said, wow, isn't, isn't this moment just like HIV and AIDS? And for me, it actually is not. Mm -hmm. um, in part because while we can talk about kind of the disproportionate impact on black communities, really this is a disproportionate impact on poor black people, yeah. right? Um, and I think if we kind of really kind of layered and had a nuanced understanding of who's being impacted, then we might see some, some backing up from black political leaders. You know, when I think about HIV and AIDS, it, it was, their pushback against it being understood as a black disease. Oh, absolutely. In part, right, in part because in fact, they didn't want to own um, right. black yeah. queer folks like yeah. myself, like, you know, um, as part and central to black communities. There was a commitment to a kind of black politics of respectability that wanted to put those folks outside of black communities. I think just because of the way this was constructed, right, as starting, as the coronavirus starting, people thought outside of Black communities. Right. And then we, it became evident. I think there was less room for Black political leadership to try to distance themselves and figure out who was being impacted. And, and in part, it's because the discussion of who's being impacted in Black communities has not, I think, been probably as layered and nuanced as it might be. Um, but can I just say one other thing about, I know, I'm, see, we're going to do this all, uh, which is, which is, you know, it's also been this incredible moment where usually when we think of Black political leadership, we're thinking of Black male leadership. And I think when you think of the mayor of Atlanta, the mayor of San Francisco, the mayor of Chicago as these kind of incredible Black women, who I think have a different approach to what it is to be a Black political leader, who are thinking about expansion, who are trying to represent Black people, but also their cities, right? I think they, you know, and, and they should 30 or 40 years later have a different approach to thinking about how do you lead in crisis than we saw in the 1990s. No, I think that's absolutely right. And, and, and I also think the ways in which um, uh, the response with HIV, the sort of stigmatization of, 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 of gay male sexuality uh, and the disease being largely characterized as a disease of white gay men uh, and the stigma that went with that, black folks did not want to have, black political leaders did not want to have anything to do with that, despite the fact from the very beginning, there were black people who certainly were infected with HIV and black women who were infected with HIV and we know this, but the stigma was so, that, that characterization stuck so solidly around, um, around um, uh, HIV and AIDS and still does, uh, frankly. But, uh, but, but also I think your point is very well taken about we have a new leadership here. So it wasn't surprising to me that it was um, Ayanna Presley uh, from Massachusetts, Congresswoman, Black woman, and Elizabeth Warren, Senator from Massachusetts, who stood together calling for the CDC to do disaggregation of data 
around uh, who was actually being uh, infected by uh, the coronavirus, though disaggregation of data by race, ethnicity, and gender was something that had happened post uh, during the HIV epidemic. So I was, when I heard that, I was, I was surprised. I was thinking, isn't that people, don't they do that regularly now? I was totally surprised. But to have to call for it again is something that is a, a little bit uh, sobering as well. That some very important processes and procedures the CDC engaged in as a result of, of the ag advocacy of folks in the HIV epidemic seem to have fallen by the wayside. I don't know what happened. And that's something that, that people are gonna be researching, I'm sure, uh, to figure out what did happen. Can I say something about the CDC? Because I actually think when you're comparing HIV and comparing the coronavirus, the CDC plays an important role in terms of thinking about what we haven't learned and what we have learned. So if, you know, one of the things I do love about Boundaries of Blackness is, is the chapter on the CDC, because I felt like I learned so much, right? Um, I think some of us come, in, come to this and think, well, there's a disease and someone discovers it and that's how it works. But what I learned through kind of writing that chapter is really um, the kind of social constructed nature of disease, right? That, that with HIV, HIV became visible um, to the kind of medical industry because there were white gay men who had insurance, who could go to doctors, who understood their health, you know, health background and could see them as being healthy and then sick and then had connections, those doctors, to the, to the local health department who could report it and then they would report it to the CDC and they would say, oh my goodness, there's something happening. At the same time, we know, Black and Latinx injection drug users were showing up, but they were showing up in emergency rooms where doctors didn't see them consistently, where doctors had pathologized them and did, couldn't see them as having been healthy and now sick, right? These are just people who were always sick. And so never saw, right, the signals that in fact something different was happening. Never contacted the local health department, never contacted the CDC. And so a disease that is out there in many different, I'm sorry? And, and these people couldn't advocate for themselves. That's right. And so a disease that's out there in many different constituencies becomes visible in one place and not in another. And that's how we begin to understand the disease. And I want to suggest that's the same thing that probably happened when we go back um, at this moment, right? It's, it's not that it started in Black communities, but oftentimes Black folks and Latinx folks who are poor and maybe uninsured were showing up in emergency rooms where doctors are overwhelmed, where they pathologize those communities, where they can't see necessarily something new happening. And so the disease becomes constructed as one that comes from China, right? That we should worry about people who have traveled internationally, that we don't have a good sense of, uh, of where it might show up in, in our own communities, how community spread will happen. And even, and my colleague Robert Vargas is doing great work on testing. Even when we start to test, we don't test in communities of color, right? So from the very beginning, we construct this as something that's outside of black communities until over and over again, the people dying from this become black people. And I think, you know, it is incumbent upon all of us who knows, we know how the CDC works and we know how health regimes produce certain disease in certain places to remind ourselves of that anytime we see the emergence of a new disease or an epidemic or a pandemic. And I think we're gonna see this again when, you know, when and if a, a vaccine um, is produced and developed, the next part of that question is gonna be who gets it first? That's right, that's and right going to be distributed and who's going to pay for it and who's not going to have the money to pay for it and all of those kinds of things. Will it be prioritized that the most vulnerable in the most marginalized populations will be the people who get it first? Will people get it in prisons? Uh, these are all places where we know that there are real serious issues, mm -hmm. uh, and, but that's going to come up as soon as the vaccines are, are ready and uh, the rapid process that's going on right now may indeed produce one in a shorter amount of time than usual. But then we're gonna be faced with that question. And I think, as you say, the regimes of the system will come into play again and we'll, we'll see, we'll see. Right, and then, and then we'll have to deal with the fact that there's a history of mistrust, rightly so, right? <laughs> in many communities 
and we're seeing poll data that suggests a, a substantial number of people aren't sure they want to take the vaccine, right, uh, when it emerges. Well, and one of the other things, just to, just to close out this point, that's been, that's, that's fundamentally, fundamentally different than the 1990s and early 2000s, social media and the, mm -hmm. the networks that make it possible for all kinds of information to spread really, really quickly around the world uh, millions of people able to get certain kinds of information, fueling all kinds of fears, anxieties, and uh, also uh, animus uh, in ways that that certainly wasn't true uh, in, in the earlier period. And, and that has made, I think, I think we're still figuring out how much difference that will make when the vaccines are, are available, but it will be shaped by that as well. Yeah, agreed. I wanted to turn to this wonderful project that you've been working on. We've just been talking about the, the actual the data, so we don't have to spend much time on, on this slide, just to remind people uh, every week what it looks like. Um, and, um, you know, we've, we've, just, we've just talked about it, but I just wanted to, to emphasize that, that you sort of broke up, you know, the points about this as one narrative, which is the disproportionate impact of of um, the pandemic on communities of color. And I think we've touched on that. Then the next narrative is for you to start talking about the project working with uh, young people in the age of, of COVID, right. studying or surveying, I should say, young people in the age of COVID, of the COVID pandemic. Yeah. So l let me just say really quickly, um, through both the Black Youth Project and Gen Forward, I've had this opportunity for uh, far too long now to be doing research and working with uh, young folks, young activists, but also uh, a larger survey that we do. And, you know, part of the work is to really kind of provide, as I said earlier, a nuanced understanding of young people and of Black communities and communities of color. Uh, and in this case, what we've been noticing is that there are kind of these two narratives. One is the disproportionate impact of COVID on communities of color. And then there's a narrative about young people, which is they're irresponsible, they're not serious, they're not taking the, the pandemic serious. And so we have these two images. One is um, a picture of a house party in Chicago that got lots of attention. And then of course, young, what appear to be primarily young white people on a beach, uh, I think in Florida. Yes. And the question is for us, it was, okay, so we do, you go to the next slide for me. There we go. So we do a bi-monthly um, survey of young adults, 18 to 36, over 30, 3,200 uh, respondents. We oversample African Americans, Latinx, and uh, Asian American uh, young adults. So we're able to disaggregate by race. And we wanted to understand, like, are they taking the pandemic seriously? Or are they uh, not paying attention? And I think there's a, a little bit of both, but I think a more complicated picture. So if we go to the next slide. Yeah. You can just, <laughs> so one of the things we just asked people was, what do you think is the most important problem facing the country? And what we find is if you put coronavirus pandemic at the top, as we would expect, young people across race and ethnicity say it's the most important issue. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I would say pay attention to some of the other things they point to, and I'll go uh, over that in a minute. But next slide when we include coronavirus pandemic as kind of a randomized response, still pluralities of young people are thinking about this issue. So the idea that somehow they're not paying attention, I don't think that that holds in terms of the data. Next mm -hmm. slide. Uh, when we ask, for example, about the best strategy for dealing with uh, the pandemic, majorities, large majorities of young people say, right, impose a stay at home order as long as it takes. I am so surprised. <laughs> yeah, they don't say kind of open up the country and allow more people to go back to work. So uh, that was another example. Next slide. And even this question about, do you think too many people have kind of disregarded the requirements of social distancing and other such measures? Majorities of young people say yes to that also, right? So that, you know, it, people are always willing to condemn their groups. So they are also saying, look, young people aren't doing as much as they could. But I think part of this data is just to remind us that we can tell these narratives about kind of how young people are, and we can use kind of images, 
uh, or an example of a party or two or three and say, you know, they're irresponsible, but we want to be more nuanced and complicated and, res and responsible in our representations. Next uh, slide. I think that's really important because okay. those images were left yeah. to do a lot of work. Yes. Uh, there wasn't much analysis other than, you know, uh, again, the production of outrage. Look at shock and horror mm -hmm. from people saying, uh, older people or uh, commentators of various sorts. Look mm -hmm. how terribly irresponsible they are. And mm -hmm. you know, that's why I, when I saw the chart, I was like, see, I bought the narrative too. <laughs> well, look, we're all. We're, I was not expecting to see what your chart showed. No, no, we're all a little buying into that narrative, right? Because you're nervous and you're like, what are they doing? And in fact, a few days later, they interviewed the young man who uh, was the host of the party in Chicago. And one of the things he said was like, I just, I just didn't know it was, you know, that the virus was that serious. And it, again, if we go back to the early messaging, it was, look, this is coming from China. These are international travelers. This is how it's going to spread. If you're in a, you know, impoverished black community where folks aren't coming from China and aren't doing a lot of international uh, travel, you might think this isn't really going to impact me and my friends. And we're telling, we were also telling young people, look, you're not going to be harmed by this. You're not really going to happen. So the real, the, the big issue was, can you transmit it to your grandparents or people in your neighborhood? But let me just go a, a couple more slides and then we'll, sure. I think, I think there's some more. The, yeah. the other thing I always try to remind people though is, you know, I know we're consumed with COVID right now, as we should be. But to remind people that just in February, before it took hold, right, when we asked young people what was the most important issue, racism came up for African Americans. We've been doing the survey since 2016. Wow. Racism always is the number one issue. Mm -hmm. For Latinx young people, immigration is always the number one issue. Mm -hmm. And so while we can feel consumed with COVID, these are young people who are still trying to kind of navigate the police, who are still trying to think about, you know, what does it mean to be safe? Am I more threatened by COVID or am I more threatened by the kind of hyper surveillance of the police in my neighborhood? And I think, we, again, it's incumbent upon us, Black leadership, to provide a kind of more complex understanding of what these young people are facing. And so, I, I mean, I was looking at this one as well. So the environment issues seem to, um, Dom, is, is that something that comes up number one under for, for the white teenagers that you typically look at all the time? And it's really interesting. For young whites, and it's not teenagers, 18 and 36 years before you, I know, they're, they're good men. For young whites, it, young. <laughs> <laughs> I said they, they have the privilege of varying what's most important to them from, from survey to survey. Sometimes it's the environment, sometimes it's healthcare, sometimes it's, you know, gun control. Mm -hmm. um, but what is really interesting is the consistency for African American and Latinx young people in particular for those issues always emerging, at least in terms of the plurality of mm -hmm. being the most important issue. Yeah. I, I think uh, that's yeah. Um, so the other thing, a couple, these couple slides just want to show you that among African Americans in particular, they're the least likely to say that their local government, their state government is doing an excellent or good job, right? And I think this is the idea about the skepticism uh, towards political institutions in black communities, right? Mm -hmm. That all of that, when you, you started out by saying, how do I explain COVID, right? The disproportionate impact. And part of it is the mistrust that many black people and young black people in particular have towards uh, political institutions that are at the center of this response, right? Mm -hmm. And so how do we figure out how to get information that they will trust um, mm -hmm. from other entities beyond, you know, the, the public health officials or the state government or your local government? And if you go to the next slide really quickly, mm -hmm. here you see about the kind of, again, young African-Americans are most likely to mistrust the information about um, the coronavirus from those types of institutions. Mm -hmm. um, there's a whole series, I think, I don't know how many slides. You have my slide set, so I don't know how many are left. Mm, that was we, it. That was it, okay, yeah. So, you know, part of it is just trying to provide context and thinking about 
black communities, but also young black people and how they are experiencing COVID-19, what that response looks like, um, and how do we tell a more complex story about how they're positioned and what they're trying to deal with. Yeah. So going back to the, the, the point you made about uh, the, 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 what was behind the, the image of the uh, party uh, that was hosted in, in the African-American community, yeah. uh, and again, you know, uh, it's the sort of generic response was, you know, what's the, um, uh, the irresponsible young people issue, and the young man saying, I didn't know how serious it was. I, I, I think not enough attention has been paid to the fact that during that particular moment, mm -hmm. and it went on not, and it went on for a while, the sirens were not blasting. Yeah. About um, what was happening. And um, despite the fact that there's a, there's a, there was an outbreak in the state of Washington, right, in the, in the nursing home, it did mean that people were beginning to understand that most people who lived in nursing homes as this spread were going to be at risk. Right. Uh, I certainly know of a, a nursing home where a dear friend of my family's passed away in Atlanta and 17 people died in that nursing home. And so the communication of risk was choppy, it was slow, it wasn't in uh, very many venues. Uh, and so again, we were, it was easy for people to move to a kind of narrative of irresponsible youth rather than saying, uh, what, what kind of serious risk are we under at the time? Now, some people might say we shouldn't, you know, perhaps we shouldn't be so hard on in entities like the CDC, but they are the place that that's the institution that's supposed to sound the alarm that's and, right. um, and make it clear what kind of risk are, are uh, the virus pose for the population, and I, I actually feel that I agree with the young man. At the time, there were there was a, there were not a lot of messages in, in public that said it's a bad idea for you to have a party. Right. Well, I I, yeah, I agree also that there could be confusion, and I think it does speak to the CDC. Right. It speaks to this administration and the diminished role of the CDC. Right. So it wasn't clear who actually you could turn to for meaningful information. I mean, there, there are any number of reasons I could say there could be confusion in black communities. The, first, the fact that it does start in Washington state where there's not a significant black population, right? Um, the fact that we have not been able to, to clearly identify what we are now, kind of what might be considered to be risk groups. We're talking about racial groups, right? We go back to HIV and AIDS again, when you don't say that the same thing is happening in Black and Latinx communities, people begin to think that, that it's not going to happen to them, right? Um, the other thing, though, I always worry about is that we are confusing what could even be bad individual decision making, right? You go into a party, shouldn't go to a party, and equating that with systems of inequality and exclusion and racism, right? When we're thinking about what's gonna put black communities at risk. Yes, we probably shouldn't be having house parties, but we also shouldn't be having people who are uninsured, who are thought to be essential workers and pushed out the door. And so there's the kind of confusion over, look, you have said this is a crisis, but black and Latinx essential workers are being forced into grocery stores to work, right? Are being forced into meat packing in, in the meat packing industry to work. And so I, I do think if I'm a young person or anybody, I'm understanding also the contradictions of the message about who is allowed to be safe and who isn't allowed to be safe, right? And, and so maybe I calculate my risk, even understanding all that and say, I'd rather do my house party, right? because I don't feel comfortable, you know, relaxing out in the street because they're, my streets are surveilled by the police, right? It, it is, there's a, there's, I'll, I'll, I'll stop, but there's a story about HIV and AIDS about injection drug users and the increase in transmission. Right. And part it had to do with using what we call dirty works, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Syringes. Um, and needles. And right. part when you when you did when researchers did interviews with people about why would you go to a shooting gallery and rent works, dirty works, right, which would increase your transmission. 
it was because if I took my own works, even though they were clean and I got stopped by the police, which was more likely, I was going to go to jail, right? And so the ways in which we've structured things like policing increase the risk that make people make what we might even consider to be bad decisions. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't think it's just about like I knew and I, or I didn't know. Yeah. It is what are the conditions that allow people to engage in, in behaviors that could put them at risk? I, I mean, I think that we see that everywhere, but the, the, uh, especially, especially during this uh, outbreak, that the, 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 the personal calculus that people have to engage in gets constructed in different ways. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that I've been, been struck by is, again, during the time when we're all supposed to be social distancing, um, how many times uh, I've seen uh, certainly many African-American leaders and others, not just African-American leaders, but other people slowly beginning to say, what makes social distancing possible? Exactly. If you, if there are two generations of folks living in a small two bedroom apartment, that's where they live. That's, they don't have anywhere else to live and they cannot, you know, in any kind of uh, um, serious way, be expected to practice social distancing. And many people in those, in those households, and we're poor, if we're talking about poor people and density of population, many of those people are working in the kind of jobs where they are also have an increased risk of being exposed to the virus because they, they are, are, are working in transportation, they're working in nursing homes, they're working as orderlies and attendees in hospitals, not just the doctors and nurses. Some of them are doctors and nurses as well, I'm sure. But, the possibility of social distancing based on where they live and where they work That's right. uh, also increase, um, increase their risk. But it was talked about, social distancing was talked about in such a sort of facile way that uh, it took a lot for people to begin to push back and say, we have to really consider what that means. But I wanted to contrast that, and I, I wanted to hear what you think about this point, mm -hmm. was also in places where we still have serious um, residential segregation. People who live on, uh, in, uh, in certain kinds of neighborhoods, more suburban, broad streets, uh, people are able to work at home, they have the, the technology and tools so they can do their work at home, versus people who live in neighborhoods that are, are much higher density of population. Again, we talked about their jobs. They're having two different experiences of this, this epidemic, this pandemic. So people in the, in the suburban homes are saying, I don't know why I can't open up my beauty shop because there's nothing happening here. There's nobody dying here. This is fine. This is, you know, we can just do a little bit of, uh, you know, uh, wearing masks and gloves and, and, and uh, you know, we should be fine. So we shouldn't be penalized for what's happening, you know, 10 miles away uh, uh, to, to people that don't live near us. No, I, I, I completely agree. I, you know, there is a, a couple of other kind of, um, I guess, contradictions, we might call them. Um, it's, we could go further and say that it's not even that nothing's happening in my suburban neighborhood. It's that I care less about the people for whom those communities are under siege and in fact are dying, right? Um, there is an article in The Guardian that suggests, where there's an argument that says, maybe there's a connection between the national news beginning to talk about the disproportionate impact in Black and Latinx communities and, you know, a few or some white people showing up at capitals with guns to say, open up my state, right? that th this is always the worry about when a disease <laughs> yeah, gets represented as being a especially devastating for one community, especially if it's a community um, where we don't, where as a country, we have shown ourselves not to value those people, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think there will have to, there's gonna have to be work to really kind of disentangle that relationship between people's understanding of this as a disease impacting Black and Latinx communities and their willingness to now reopen up the country. So that's one thing. I think the other contradiction for people on social distancing is that we know from studies already that groups, uh, 
where groups were larger than the government said you could gather, yes. you were more likely to get a citation in black communities than you were in white communities, right? Yeah. And we have seen, again, hundreds of white people coming to capitals with guns um, and no masks and no social distancing and nothing happens, right? No and, and we all know that if those were black people, right, gathering like that, people would be kind of at best carted off to jail and we could only think about what might happen as worse. So there are all kinds of contradictions, political contradictions that are evident and visible to people. So we shouldn't be surprised when people say, I don't trust the government. Right. I don't trust the information that I'm receiving about this pandemic. And I see the differential response to this pandemic uh, that's happening across communities. Yeah. So one of the things that you've also been very, very astute about, Kathy, and taught us all so much about how to think about this, um, there's a kind of ad advocacy and activism that emerged around HIV, the creation of all kinds of, of uh, non-governmental organizations. I think about Sister Love, the first uh, NGO for African-American women with HIV in Atlanta. Um, the Human Rights Campaign had a big boost during the period of HIV because they were one of the leading groups speaking on behalf of of, of gay men and, 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 and they had a broad position as well over time. But do you see any possibility for a, a, any kind of political activism on the part of, a, of people in affected communities coming out of this? Oh, oh definitely. I mean, I think, I think I see the continuation of political work happening in communities of color. Uh, the Movement for Black Lives, for example, has a policy agenda around COVID, a radical policy agenda around COVID. I think um, there's new groups like the Rising Majority that are thinking about and responding to COVID-19. I think it's not just the political organizing that's happening around COVID, but the ways in which people are attaching the ongoing, you know, um, political work around police brutality, around, you know, systemic racism to say this is a continuation of that work. Um, but, you know, and this is another place I think where we're going to point to the work of young people, right, who are already in community, who have built organizations, who have uh, a relationship with other young people and who are prepared to move on this. And I think this is, you know, I keep saying to people, this is devastating for our communities. You know, we are all going to have to grieve. But I think it's also an opportunity for us to think about what is possible. So for a very long time, we've been told, for example, that we can't stop uh, utility shutoffs. But actually, yes, you can. Yes. We've been told that we can't stop evictions. But guess what? In a pandemic, yes, you can, right? And we can go down the list. We can't release folks who are incarcerated. But actually, yes, you can. And so I think if we can kind of take this moment to say, all, you know, here are the many things that you said weren't possible, um, but here's the future that in fact we want, the radical future that we want based on things like, no, we're not gonna evict people anymore who can't afford to pay their rent. And yes, we're gonna find places for folks who are homeless to live. And yes, we're gonna slow or stop the repayment of student loans, right? I mean. I, I think this is a way, this is a moment, in fact, where in all of those discrepancies, inequalities, problems, you know, the, the dangers of racial capitalism are made bare and visible for people. And it's going to be the political work of organizations in community that get people to think about what is it they want beyond the pandemic. And I think that's part of the discussion we have to have right now. No, I, I think that's I, I think that's absolutely right, and and it makes me feel a little bit more hopeful because I I think you're right. I think there are these 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 things that have been pretty entrenched, and a lot of people have been fighting for a very long time. Again, you know, should we have uh, should we continue to believe that uh, folks should be um, uh, crowded into certain kinds of neighborhoods and uh, low income people have a hard time? You know, there are programs to allow for folks to get vouchers to live in suburban neighborhoods, for example. Those voucher programs have always been really, really difficult for people to, to um, expand. 
And maybe this is a moment when some people might be able to use all the work they've been doing all these years to get some expansion in those. So folks can have more, op for poor people to have more options in where they, they can live and, and, and are able to uh, afford to live. Right. So I think that's a really, that's a really, really important point that uh, th th there are places uh, and things that have been, or as should we say, weakened uh, within our institutions that, that many advocates and activists can take advantage of in this moment. And um, I'm convinced they probably will, and that would be a good thing. So I want to stop the share right now, and I'm going to just turn to the chat and give folks time to ask us some questions. Um, uh, so we have a lot of, uh, we have a few more uh, sort of, uh, fewer questions and more sort of, uh, more kind of laudatory <laughs> kind of uh, comments. Um, so, but here's sort of a question. It would be interesting. Okay. It would be interesting to test whether African Americans trust African American public health experts more than they trust European American public health, public mm -hmm. health experts. Mainstream media continues to utilize the same demography of experts they always have, which are typically white. Uh, let me try, let me have one point to make about it, and I turn it over to you to give a comment about it. Uh, I find it interesting that uh, the president of the American Medical Association, also a black woman, mm -hmm. who had a wonderful op-ed in the New York Times, and I thought it was wonderful in part because what she did was first say very clearly, we are not talking about some biological basis to the vulnerabilities of black people to this virus. She just hit that right on the head and stop the notion that there's some, some physiological, biological difference between black people's and black and brown people's bodies and white bodies. She just dispensed with that and went right to social determinants of health. I was surprised, I was heartened by that. I thought it was very forthright and straightforward. Uh, and I certainly didn't expect that from, that clearly from the president of the American Medical Association. Uh, but the fact that she's a black woman, I think, and, and probably has, and certainly mentioned in her article, long experience of thinking about health disparities. Right. No, I, I, I think that's right. I mean, um, well, I, I guess there are two points here. One is, one of the lovely things about, for example, living in a city with a black woman as mayor, <laughs> we have joked that, that, you know, there are these black mama moments and i don't i mean you know uh, maybe she's gender not conforming so black parent moment where she's like i told you to stay away from the lake shore right like and now i'm taking it away from you it's almost that like don't make me have to come back there moment right and it, it does you hear her channeling your mother's voice absolutely i'm like i'm sorry i'm sorry right um so i do think there is a way in which um a kind of uh, communal uh, or community-based culture allows the message to come through in a different sort of way, right? Um, now, that said, I also think that just writing in the New York Times isn't gonna do it, right? Because most folks ain't reading the, the New York Times. So it's also where are we engaging these discussions, right? Um, and who are the other types of leaders, uh, influencers that we want to be giving this message to? Many of them are kind of cultural producers, right? Or young activists. And so while I appreciate um, elected political leaders and, and leaders of institutions kind of standing up and making clear points about this, I think we have to kind of widen uh, the group of individuals that are given a platform to kind of make the case about uh, what, what communities of color must do in response to uh, okay. COVID-19. I really agree with the, the last part of the question in terms of the fact that it's still a small number of, of voices who are making certain kinds of, uh, uh, who are adding some complexity to the really sort of easy, facile uh, responses, but I was particularly struck by that one. Uh, here's a question I think that was that's really uh, important and we haven't really addressed in other conversations. Um, and it is, I wonder if you might be willing to speak to questions of gender and sexuality, gendered labor, gendered violence, theorizing black women's experiences in relation to African Americans in the time of, in the time of COVID. 
You want to take that first, Evelyn? Take that first? <laughs> no. I uh, think, uh, oh boy, can I speak to the gendered nature? I think that, thank you, first of all, for uh, that question. When we're talking about the gendered nature, in this case, for example, we might be talking about um, both uh, cis and trans women who take on, and also gender non-conforming folks who take on the work of providing support often for families, for communities, for cities. We we're just talking about Black women as, um, as mayors, but, but the ways in which women do care work, right? Um, both care work outside of the home. I've been especially kind of uh, thinking about um, home health care workers. Absolutely. Who, you know, I have uh, my niece is one who are, you know, continue to go into homes to take care of folks mm -hmm. uh, because they care about those folks, but also because they need the money um, where they have agencies that are taking part of their paychecks, where they may not be getting the benefits that they need to make sure that they're safe uh, and that they have health care, right? So as we talk about kind of what's happening in nursing homes, the ways in which we often make invisible, often Black women, um, Black immigrant women who are doing the work uh, in those environments. And then, of course, just the ways in which women and women of color are doing the care work in their homes and their communities, right? Um, to make sure that people have the things that they need for surviving and hopefully thriving, to make sure older folks have food, the work that they do if they're attached to uh, a church or a community group, right? So you're absolutely right to kind of raise the issue of the kind of gendered nature of labor, especially during um, moments of crisis. Or for example, and I'm gonna stop, the ways in which women do care work around mass incarceration, yeah. ensuring that both the men and women that they love who are incarcerated, right, uh, have some type of care or at least some type of watch, calling, um, calling jails and prisons to check on people because many of those places are in lockdown and are not given the provisions that they need to make sure that there's safety and health in those environments, right? So I, you know, we could go on and on and on about this, but you're absolutely right to not, to not lose the kind of gendered nature of this work and this crisis, yeah. So I, I think one of the things that's really important about, uh, and I'm glad you mentioned the, the sort of gender, the question was asked about the gendered labor and the emphasis needs to be put on who does the care work because care work is not valued in this society. Uh, preschool, people work in preschools. Or if you look at, or, or as you just said, who's, who's doing a lot of the care for the elderly in nursing homes, outside of nursing homes, and caring for their own families as well. Women are doing the care work. And as my good friend, uh, Susan Reverby wrote about in her first book on the history of nursing, order to care in a society that doesn't value caring. Exactly. And that depends on caring, a capitalist, let's say, a capitalist society that depends on private caring, right, but doesn't value private caring. So, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, I think those are, I think it's really should be more visible to people now. I hope it is. Also the hierarchy within the hospital systems. So you can see, you know, certainly there are increasing numbers of, of people of color uh, in the top levels of the medical hierarchy in a hospital, but the bottom level of people cleaning up every day and taking care of, the, of the, all the things that come with what it means to care for people in acute settings, those are largely black and brown people. And we can't forget that they are those people who are doing that work and continue to do that work even as right. it is putting themselves uh, at risk. So I think that was a really... That was a great, can I just say, and I think it adds another dimension to thinking about the disproportionate impact of this pandemic on communities of color, right? Like one way is to say who's, who's dying, who's, you know, who's infected, well not infected, but who has the virus. Another way is to say who's doing the care work around this pandemic. And, uh, you know, I think we should always, and I will be more careful in kind of that expanded. No, and I, I think we do, do need to talk about that more carefully. I mean, I, I was struck by a story and then I, I want to move to just one last question. Yeah. I was struck by a story of the bus driver. I think it was Detroit, an African-American man who kept, you know, he's driving, well, that was his job. He had to drive the bus and he, he ended up uh, contracting the virus and died. And I just thought, who dies from when you have to be a bus driver? 
you know, unless it's some kind of accident, you know what I mean? The mm -hmm. kind of risk. And I just thought the story was poignant and, and you know, emotional and, and shocking in many ways. But to speak to who's doing that work, and it was sort of clear that he, he knew how valuable he was in the link of helping people in this community get to where they needed to go. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's the piece that needed to be pointed to. That's a part of care work as yeah. well. Um, so Kathy, we just have a few minutes left and I just want to give you the last word. There's some great questions about the digital nice. side, which we can still talk about. About the election. About the election. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, and all I want to say is everybody, you know, you have to vote uh, and you have to deal <laughs> with it. And I hope everybody knows that. But uh, is that- well, let's, just, let's just say one thing about the kind of how COVID is going to complicate the election. I know we, we got to end. See, we were like, are we going to have enough to say? Um, <laughs> that, you know, make sure you know where your polling place is. Decide if, you know, help your state decide, meaning advocate if there should be vote by mail. Um, think about the candidates. Let's think about who the Biden VP pick should be. Right. I mean, there's, there are many, many, we should think about the ability of groups to mobilize voters, right, to register voters under the pandemic. I mean, the infrastructure of voting has changed. And that is, you know, there, there are also all these other ways in which people are trying to um, dismiss or um, contain the, the vote in communities of color and um, among young people. So we've got to be paying attention to all of that, not just the candidates, but of course, you want to pay attention to the candidates. Of course. I mean, I think this is a moment where, um, as I continue to say, what the pandemic does, it reveals structural yeah. inequalities in our society. Once they are revealed, then we have responsibility to act uh, and hopefully we'll act on the part on, on, uh, in the best interest of the communities that we are deeply concerned about. So we have to stop. Thank you, Kathy. I was absolutely not worried that we would have enough to talk. About. <laughs> I was, I was, okay. I don't know why you were worried. But thank you so much. It's been a really wonderful conversation. I really ap appreciate people joining us again for um, uh, this week. Uh, we'll be probably taking a break next week because uh, Thursday is Harvard commencement. And so we'll wait probably another week for another webinar. But thank you again, Kathy. I really appreciate it. I think it was a fabulous conversation. Thank you. It was great to be in conversation with you. Okay. See All you right. soon. Bye-bye.